going to talk about, and the subject of my book is what I think is one of the most, if not the most important political economic fact of our time. And that is the fact that income inequality is surging, particularly between people at the very top and everybody else. This has been a shift which is most striking in the United States and the UK, but it's really a global phenomenon. It's happening in communist China, in formerly communist Russia, it's happening in India, it's happening in my own native Canada, it's even happening in sort of the cozy social democracies like Finland and Sweden and Germany. The one part of the world that is a little bit of an exception is actually Latin America, but income inequality there was so high to begin with, sort of hard to imagine the societies there becoming even more polarized. So I'd like to start by giving you a few data points to give a sense of how great the shift has been. In the 1970s in the United States, the top 1% accounted for roughly 10% of the national income. Today, the top 1% accounts for more than 20% of the national income. So that's more than doubling. But to me, what's even striking is what's happened at the very top of the distribution. So the 0.1%, the top 10% of the 1%, today accounts for close to 8% of the national income. That tiny sliver is pretty close to where the 1% was in the 70s. And that's not that long ago. You know, I, I remember the 70s. I think most of us do. Uh, I'd like to give you another number to give you a sense of what's happened. And this is a calculation that was first done by Robert Reich, who was the Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. He figured out that if in 2005 you took the wealth, talking now about wealth, not income, of two admittedly very, very rich people, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, that was equivalent to the wealth of the bottom 40% of the US population, of 120 million people. Now, interestingly, um, Buffett, of course, is not only a plutocrat himself, he is one of the most thoughtful and astute critics of the phenomenon. And he has his own favorite figure to show what's been going on. Um, he used this one on one of my favorite news sources, The John Stewart Show. Uh, and what Buffett pointed out was that in 1992, the combined fortune of everyone on the Forbes 400 list of the richest Americans was 300 billion. You didn't even have to be a billionaire to be on the list. Just think about that. Today, the figure has more than quintupled to 1.7 trillion. And consider that in the context of a period when the wealth of the American middle class has at best stagnated in that time and by some measures shrunk. Um, one of the numbers that I am Canadian and one of the things that cheers Canadians up when they're feeling depressed about their economy is that in the first time in living memory, the wealth of the average Canadian is actually higher than the wealth of the average American. Think about that for a minute. What is also striking about what's happening is how it has really turned out to be a phenomenon which is structural rather than cyclical. So I uh, got a publisher to agree to publish my book in September 2008. And you will recall uh, that that month was significant for more reasons than the fact that I got a book deal. Uh, and so when Lehman went bankrupt, I was sad in the way all people concerned about the world and the possibility of a Great Depression might be. But I was really devastated because I was worried that it meant I had to write a different book. You know, it seemed to me self-evident that this phenomenon that I had been writing about would come to an end with the financial crisis. And I was so convinced that that was sort of the end of the line that I wrote a whole new book proposal. It was gonna be called The Survivors, and it was gonna be about who sort of made it out of the crisis and sort of the new world uh, which was going to be created. But 
then a funny thing happened. And as we sort of rolled into 2009, it, it looked more and more as if there wasn't going to be that profound shift. And in fact, as the data have started coming in, we've seen that actually the impact of the recession has been to lean into the trends that existed before rather than to lean out of them. Uh, the economist who is probably the, the most uh, sort of assiduous data jock of all of these numbers is a guy called Emmanuel Saez at Berkeley. And he keeps updated a global data set that freely available online. And he updates it every year with the latest tax numbers. When he updated it in March of this year, um, so that meant that his figures went up to 2011, he basically found that the recovery, such as it has been, was really a 1% recovery. So the economic recovery between 2009 and 2011 in the United States, and there was a recovery in income then, 121% of the gains in that period went to the 1%. And you may say, how is that possible? Well, of course, it's because the incomes at that very top at 1% increased by 11% over that period. But for 99% of Americans, they actually decreased a little bit by 0.4%. Um, a final sort of data point to give a sense of how really global this phenomenon is, and it's something that is playing out around the world and in a global economy. Another economist who follows and writes about this a lot is a guy called Branko Milanovic, who is at the World Bank. And he decided a few years ago to do a kind of a fun economic history paper. And lest you think that that's not a possible thing, um, what Branko decided to do is figure out who is the richest person who ever lived. Um, now, people of a sort of uh, pedantic turn of mind will immediately say, that's impossible. You know, how can you calculate, how can you compare the value of owning slaves with the value of having an iPhone and maybe a private jet? So the way Branco got around this is to calculate how many hours of your countryman's labor could your total wealth buy. And using that metric, he let, looked across history. He looked at Roman patricians, he looked at Renaissance princes, he looked at the American robber barons. Nelson Rockefeller came in pretty high on the list. Uh, but according to Branco's calculations, the richest person who has ever lived in all time is Carlos Slim, the Mexican telecoms and retail billionaire. Um, so we're living in this age really of, you know, by some measures unprecedented, and, and at the very least, you know, unprecedented in our lifetimes, of a real chasm in the income distribution. And we've been slow to notice it. I, I think that part of the reason is it's sort of a boiled frog phenomenon. I think humans are quicker to notice a change which is a sharp, sudden shock, like the financial crisis, like a terrorist attack. It's harder for us to really be aware of a change which is gradual may be very extreme in its implications. The frog does get boiled, but happens over time. I, I think that's a problem we have when it comes to climate change. I think that's a problem we have in, in really understanding these sort of deep shifts in the economy. I think there's another reason that it has been hard to really think about this and grapple with it, and, and that's that it makes a lot of us uncomfortable. Uh, there's been a really comfortable politically and socially paradigm which actually really worked in the post-war era, which was that what you needed to focus on was making the pie bigger. And if you succeeded in doing that, everyone's slice would get bigger too. It's really, I think, unpleasant to think about, well, maybe even if the pie is getting bigger, things are happening in the distribution which in and of themselves are a problem. And uh, Branco has a comment about this, which I love the way he put it, so I'll read you, I'll read you his observation. Uh, this is Branko Milanovic, the Carlos Slim calculation guy. Um, I was once told by the head of a prestigious think tank in Washington, D.C., 
that the think tank's board was very unlikely to fund any work that had income or wealth inequality in its title. Yes, they would finance anything to do with poverty alleviation, but inequality was an altogether different matter. Why? Because my concern with the poverty of some people actually projects me in a very nice, warm glow. I am ready to use my money to help them. Charity is a good thing. A lot of egos are boosted by it and many ethical points earned, even when only tiny amounts are given to the poor. But inequality is different. Every mention of it raises, in fact, the issue of the appropriateness or, le or the legitimacy of my income. So I, I think Branco is right, and, and that's part of the reason that these are really sensitive and difficult issues to actually face and talk about. I'd like to talk a little bit now about you know, who are these people at the very top? What are they like? And the first point I'd like to make, and this carries on from the Carlos Slim point, is you know, globalization is a real thing. And especially at the top of the economy, capital is global, and the people who are sort of the masters of these global capital flows are living in a truly global space. Uh, an observation that helped me to really understand what was going on um, was a comment from a friend of mine, Glenn Hutchins, who's the co-founder of the private equity firm Silver Lake, uh, most recently in the news because they were involved in the possible Dell going private. And I talked to Glenn about this, and I sort of said, you know, what does your world look like? How, how, how is it shaped? And this is how Glenn put it. A person, who run, a person in Africa who runs a big African bank and went to Harvard Business School has more in common with me than he does with his neighbors. And I have more in common with him than I do with my neighbors. The circles he moves in, Glenn told me, are more defined by interests than they are by geography. Beijing can look a lot like New York. You see the same people, you eat in the same restaurants, you stay in the same hotels. We are much less place-based than we used to be. And I love that line so much because actually I think if you took the average person from the streets of Beijing and put them in Manhattan, or the average New Yorker and put them on the street in Beijing, they could tell in about 30 seconds that they were in a different city. Um, you know, Beijing, in fact, does not look at all like New York. These are profoundly different places. But in this world that Glenn lives in, they're the same. And, 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 and what was especially interesting for me is Glenn's observation, which I think is absolutely true. He sees the same people, whether he's in the Four Seasons in New York or the Four Seasons in Beijing or the Four Seasons in Dubai. It, it's the same universe of people all traveling around the world at a pretty frenetic pace and making the global economy run. The other really key issue, and this is something that I think a lot of the people who think about income inequality tend to want to gloss over, because quite often people who focus on it tend to be coming from the progressive side of things and maybe aren't too fond of the plutocrats. Um, and that is the fact that increasingly this is a meritocratic group. This is a group more and more of self-made people. Emmanuel Saez, who is the data jock, calls them the working rich, compared with that sort of great Gatsby elite, which was much more of a rentier, inherited wealth class. And that shift has been happening precisely as we've seen income inequality surge. So a very, recent, a very good recent study by a couple of professors at the University of Chicago looked at the Forbes 400 list, a great source of data if you're interested in the super, super elite. And they found that in 1982, 40 only 40% of the people on the Forbes 400 list were what they called first generation sort of super rich. Now that did, or self-made. That group, that category, didn't mean you had to be born in utter poverty. You could be born in a comfortable, middle class, even affluent environment and still count as self-made by these University of Chicago professors. But their sort of decision point was, 
did you build the business that made you rich yourself or did you inherit it? So 40% in 1982. By 2011, that number was 69%. So that's a really big shift in a short period of time. And it's really important to think about that too as you're thinking both about what are the drivers and frankly, what is the self-perception of the people who get there. So what are the economic drivers that are causing this? What, what's happening in the world economy to cause this really profound shift? I think that there are basically two sets of causes. Uh, and again, interestingly, I found in talking to economists about it, although economists like to think of themselves as sort of the queen of the social sciences, much more data-driven than you know, those yucky historians. I happen to have studied history. Um, uh, I found that sort of in, in personal political biases came out a lot in which factors economists tended to emphasize. So from the progressive side, the real focus tends to be on the political drivers of increasing income inequality. And there are a lot. You know, it's that this whole sort of suite of neoliberal economic reforms. Deregulation, lower taxes, privatization, weakening protection for legal unions, even a shift in culture, which has made it much more acceptable to have a really big gap between what the CEO earns and what the median worker in his company earns. So there are, there are those sort of you know, self-made causes, you might say. And, and I think those self-made, that, that suite of political causes is one reason why, although you've seen a surge in income inequality around the world, it's been much more muted in places where those political factors haven't been pushed as hard, you know, like Finland, like Denmark, like Sweden, like Germany. I think it even accounts for some of the difference between Canada and the US. But there is also a whole set of economic drivers. And again, these are pretty apparent. You know, globalization, the technology revolution taken together have created these real spirals of a winner-take-all economy, a possibility to invent something really terrific, sell it rather than just to your own local community, to a global marketplace of at least a billion people now in the middle class. And all of a sudden, you know, you're talking real money. In, in thinking about how to respond to the drivers, you know, what, what do we want to do about it, I actually think the political set of issues, especially what you might want to call the bad political drivers, the, the, the group of things that people like to talk about as crony capitalism or rent seeking, I actually think that's the easy part of the problem. Politically, it's really, really hard to uproot crony capitalism. Uh, I started off as a reporter in Russia, and I think that you could simply, as a journalist in Russia, just rewrite your story about getting rid of corruption uh, and crony privatization and really publish the same story, changing the names every year for the past 20 years. So, you know, politically, that is not an easy thing to change. And it's not an easy thing to do in our own societies as well. I think financial deregulation has turned out to be a real example of crony capitalism in the United States and in Britain. And even post the financial crisis, that wasn't very easy to change either. But at least intellectually, when it comes to crony capitalism, you know, this set of political changes that have benefited political insiders without growing the pie overall, I think we can all agree that that's a bad thing. Um, I've talked to a lot of the plutocrats, including the Russian oligarchs, and no one thinks I'm a crony capitalist. Everyone thinks the other guy is, and everyone is happy to sign up uh, to some sort of a platform that would say, let's get rid of it, in theory. And, you know, it, it's even something where we're seeing a real consensus, on, even in very politically polarized United States, on the right and on the left. I don't think it's an accident that both the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street have some sort of definition of crony capitalism and the need to get rid of it at the center of their platforms. Where I think things get a lot more complicated and, and truly, you know, very hard for us as a society to understand what we want to do about it is when you get to the economic drivers of this surging income inequality. Uh, 
Um, and these are the combined forces of the technology revolution and globalization. Um, we see those at work, I think, most obviously when it comes to the technology revolution. You know, we've become accustomed to people like David Karp, the 26-year-old guy who founded Tumblr. 26, right? And his company has been bought recently by Yahoo for more than a billion dollars. That's now a familiar story. And that's because this combination of very, very swift technological change, which you can scale globally, means Tumblr probably is worth a billion dollars, certainly to Yahoo. What's really interesting, and I think maybe less immediately obvious, is that that sort of superstar phenomenon is happening not only in an obvious place like technology, it's happening in pretty much every sector. So there are superstar bankers, there are superstar lawyers, there are superstar architects, there are superstar cooks, maybe some of us will be fed by some of those superstar cooks here in Aspen. There are superstar farmers who will produce the food those superstar cooks cook for us. Um, there are even superstar dentists. So like, if you look at the income distribution in any profession, you're seeing this winner take all, where to be in the top very, very small group in the profession, you're great, and real downward pressure on everybody else. And I even found who I think is the most superstar of the dental profession. Um, he is a guy called Bernard Tuati. He's French, of course. Uh, and he broke into the superstar leagues because he began fixing the teeth of the Russian oligarchs. Uh, Roman Abramovich set up a little dental office in his own office so Tuati could come and do his teeth. And from there, he went on to do other oligarchs, their wives, Diane von Furstenberg, and so on. Um, so we're really seeing these superstar cycles everywhere. What's less obvious is what do you do about it if globalization and technology revolution are sort of throwing up these people at the very top? Um, and, and, and maybe, you know, it's a good thing. Uh, I'd like to, you know, starting with technology, I, I think it's really important um, to remember that this is a powerful and a positive driver. We don't want to be Luddites. We don't want to smash the machine. Um, the machine is bringing benefit to all consumers and, and really transforming our lives as humans. I'm an even bigger believer in globalization, uh, which can sometimes get more of a rap. But I think we have to remember when thinking about globalization, again, not only that it has made a lot of the stuff that all of us use much more affordable, including empowering the technology revolution. You know, we all know who makes our iPhones. Um, we know who makes our T-shirts. But it also has done what decades and decades of development economics have been unable to do, which is lift hundreds of millions of the world's poorest people out of absolute poverty and into something approaching the middle class. And, and that is really one of the big stories of our time, what's happening, particularly in Asia, but increasingly now in Africa, where we've had a decade of sustained 5% plus economic growth. So, What's not to like about globalization, the technology revolution? I'm now gonna talk about a few of the issues. Um, and these are, I'm sort of setting aside the easy parts, setting aside the crony capitalism stuff that we can all agree, you know, that's bad, we can get rid of it. Of course, we'll fight forever over what specifically is crony capitalism, but we're not gonna disagree on the merits of the case. One thing that I think we really need to worry about is the extent to which even meritocratic plutocracy can shift into being crony plutocracy. So even if you're one of those 69% of the Forbes 400 list who is truly self-made, once you get there, once you invent your great thing and have the economic and political power that goes with it, inevitably that starts bleeding into also being political power. And again, this is not a hypothetical fear. This is what we're seeing with what I would say are some of the world's greatest, most innovative companies, Google, Amazon, Apple, Starbucks, who also turn out to be particularly good at working the global political economy 
to really minimize their taxes. Uh, that's been one of the huge stories in the UK over the past six months, as Britain has discovered that companies like Starbucks, like Google, really pay almost no taxes. And you know, the companies say, look, that's not our fault. That's the fault of the system that you and your wisdom in the European Union created. We've seen something similar with Apple using how the global political economy works to really minimize its tax take. You can have, I think, some sympathy with part of what's going on because partly I think we have a real mismatch between a world in which capital is global but political systems are national. And so if you're a company operating in that global space, it's easy, to it's easy to arbitrage, and some of the onus is gonna be on governments to get together and really start to globalize those areas in which the economy is global. But as we all know, these companies that are super successful, these individuals that are super successful in the business space, sometimes don't just content themselves with taking advantage of the existing rules of the game. It becomes tempting to start trying to shift the rules of the game in your own favor. And again, I think that was very vividly at play in what I think is probably you know, the most egregious political economic abuse of the past 20 years, which was the privatization of Russia's natural resources, um, which was really orchestrated by the oligarchs who ultimately got them. And, and what was crucial here was, I think from the outside, people think, well, that, that must have been corruption. They, they must have paid off the officials. And what the oligarchs said to me, and I think this is largely true, is they said, you know, of course, we would have been thrilled, delighted, perfectly happy to pay off the guys who did this. But we found, and, and one of them used this line, which was so beautiful, as long as we explain to them that our ideas were in keeping with their view of the necessity of market reform, they just did what we wanted. He said, like little darlings, they put it into their laws. Um, so, you know, these meritocrats, you know, who are sort of the smartest guys in the room, can frankly run circles around a lot of the politicians. Um, and again, I think that that's partly the story of financial deregulation. A second thing that I worry about a lot as we see this chasm of rising income inequality is the extent to which what starts off as a meritocracy can become an aristocracy. Uh, and you know, particularly in this world today, where sophisticated analytical skills are so much a key to success, really intense education from a very young age is really important. And again, you don't need to be a professor, a student of education to understand this. We're seeing this in, in what people are actually doing. We've seen over the past 20 years a surge in spending on education. And the middle class has actually started to spend a lot more too. But inevitably, the middle class has been outspent by people at the very top, really hugely. And again, this to me is a really, really hard problem. Uh, I was talking to Larry Summers about it, the former Secretary of the Treasury and former president of Harvard University. And he said, you know, he gave me an example, not an answer, but an example of the dilemma. Um, when Larry was president of Harvard, he liked to drop in on the deliberations of the admissions uh, committee. And if you know Larry, I think you can imagine how much pleasure the members of that committee would take from Larry dropping in, um, but he would. Uh, and he said there was a particularly tough case where there was this kid, as Larry called him, uh, who had really good grades from a top public school, a private school, really good SATs, and Larry said clearly he would do fine, do well at Harvard, but didn't have any, you know, that special distinguishing thing which gets you in, apart from one thing. And the one thing this kid had was he spoke fluent Mandarin. And the extra twist was he hadn't learned it at school as part of his curriculum. He had learned it privately. Starting in grade nine, he decided he wanted to learn Mandarin and his parents got in a tutor who came in four days a week and he learned Mandarin. And as a parent myself, 
I can just imagine what a joy it would be to have a child who says, I want two hours a day of extra Mandarin teaching. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, but Larry said, you know, the problem that presented itself is very few parents could actually afford to provide to a child who had that desire, which is a great thing, those two hours a day of private Mandarin teaching. And so Larry says, what do you do? Uh, in the end, the kid got into Harvard because they decided you shouldn't discriminate against him because he had parents able to do this. But I think that, present, that example shows you just how naughty this issue is. And we are seeing it turn up already in the data. Uh, there's something that Alan Kruger, who has just finished a stint as the head of the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House, calls the Great Gatsby Curve. And for wonks, I'll give you the further reference. It's based on research done by a guy called Miles Korak at the University of Ottawa. And it shows a pretty direct correlation between rising income inequality and declining social mobility. And again, I think that this is something that Americans need to particularly worry about. Um, America, I think, sees itself, and I think you should be proud to see yourself this way, as the land of opportunity, the land of the American dream. But the reality is in the data right now, social mobility in America is not only lower than it was in the post-war era, it's lower than it is in much of Western Europe and in Canada. Um, so think about that for a minute. If you're born at the bottom, you have a better chance in a place like Denmark or Sweden or Canada than you do in the United States. I think that's pretty terrifying. Um, a third issue that I think is really important and again um, can sometimes be hard to notice is the way in which with this sort of economic chasm there's a growing sort of social and cultural and intellectual divide, um, particularly between the people at the very top and the rest of society. Um, a reason that I think it's hard to notice is, interestingly, even though we live in this time of really surging income inequality, this sort of the, the, the social deal, sort of the way the culture operates is very egalitarian. You know, the look and the feel. It, think about Downton Abbey and how just by looking at what someone was wearing, you could immediately see their class, even how they spoke. And, and that's not how things work today. Uh, and to give you sort of a few examples of sort of our collective desire to think that there's no big gap, I just want to read you a couple of quotes. Um, one of them comes from Bill Gates. Uh, in 2010, he gave a talk at MIT. And one of the kids, and I admire this kid so much, asked the question that I'm sure every single person in the room wanted to ask but wouldn't dare to, which is, what's it like to be a billionaire? Uh, and this is what Gates said. Well, the marginal return for extra dollars does drop off. I haven't found any burgers at any price that are better than McDonald's. After a few million or something, it's all about how you're going to give it back. So the sort of official view is, it's not really that big a deal. We all eat the same burgers. Um, and I talked to Eric Schmidt, who was at the time the CEO of Google, about this also. And, and he said, you know, that's a real, it's a big part of the valley culture. That at some level, and, and it, 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 it's a really interesting paradox, right? Precisely in the place where we're seeing the most of these extreme fortunes created. And actually, it's a place where there is also really quite extreme income inequality. The unemployment levels post-recession were very high in the valley, but the official culture is an egalitarian one. Uh, and I had a few examples of that. When I went to interview Eric, um, first of all, his office was maybe a quarter the size of this stage. Um, and there was a whiteboard on it and had some equations written on it. And I will reveal to you a journalistic secret. Uh, we like to flatter the people we interview. Um, we think it will make them say things to, reveal things to us. So I saw the equations, I said to Eric, you know, Eric, this is so impressive. Here you are, the CEO of Google, and you're still a working engineer. You have equations on your whiteboard. And he said, um, those aren't my equations. It turned out that if he wasn't in his office, Anyone who felt like on the floor 
could just sit in the CEO's office and have a little meeting and use his whiteboard. So pretty extreme. Um, also, according to Eric, you're not allowed to have a car and driver in the valley. Uh, and here's how he explained it. Whereas in other cultures, you can drive your Rolls Royce around and just sort of look rich and have a really good time. In technology, it's not socially okay to have a driver who drives you to work. I don't know why, but you'll notice nobody does it. He says it is okay to have a private jet. Um, uh, and sort of interestingly, you know, there are some levels in the company where you can't do this. Uh, and so here's how Eric explains sort of, you know, in a way the sort of the invisible underclass. Um, Many companies solve the problem by having the lowest paid workers not actually be employees. They're contracted out. We can treat them differently because we don't really hire them. The person who's cleaning the bathroom is not exactly the same sort of person, which I find sort of offensive, but it's the way it's done. So, you know, that's, that's the cultural paradox of, of how you deal with this. I saw this sort of division coming through, and this sort of complicated one, when I talked to people about the hollowing out of the middle class and the financial crisis. Um, so on the hollowing out of the middle class, you know, I think that this is, you know, the, probably the most difficult, you know, one of the most difficult issues of our time. And the people at the very top see this. I mean, a lot of them are building their businesses around it. But the way they talk about it is different from the way people in, in, in the middle class talk about it. So I'll just give you a few examples. Um, I talked to a hedge fund guy, Greenwich-based, originally Scandinavian, went to a liberal arts college um, about the hollowing out of the American middle class. And he said sort of in sorrow, but also as an investment strategy, the low-skilled American worker is the most overpaid worker in the world. Um, another observation, again, this was from the CEO of a big fund manager. And uh, he said this wasn't his point of view, but a point of view expressed at his investment committee, um, was that the hollowing out of the American middle class didn't really matter if you could look at it from a global perspective. And, and, and this was how he put it. His point was that, and this is his colleague's point, if the transformation of the world economy lifts four people in China and India out of poverty and into the middle class, and meanwhile, one American drops out of the middle class, that's not such a bad trade. And in some ways it's not, but if you're in that American middle class, it's not so great. Um, and then a final point, and this came from a really interesting person, someone who really epitomized the American dream and sort of the self-made plutocracy. This was a guy in his late 30s at the time I spoke to him. He and his, his parents had immigrated with him and his brother from Taiwan when they were children. And his parents told them, I love this line, the family was going to be temporarily poor. And sure enough, the boys did fabulously well, went to Stuyvesant. They were so sort of emotionally connected with the math club that they still uh, fund the Stuyvesant High School Math Club. Uh, his brother went on to trade credit derivatives uh, on Wall Street, and this guy dropped out of his, of his PhD in applied math at Stanford to start being the CFO in a number of technology companies that were sold off for a lot of money. And this is what he said when I talked to him about what's going on in the American middle class. We demand a higher paycheck than the rest of the world. So if you're going to demand 10 times the paycheck, you need to deliver 10 times the value. It sounds harsh, but maybe people in the middle class need to decide to take a pay cut. Again, not untrue if you're looking at the dynamics of the global economy, but politically and socially, a very difficult thing. Um, a final point on this sort of social division um, is I think a real shift in relationship to society and responsibility to society. And, and you know, the 0.01% is not homogeneous. Different people have very different points of view. 
but partly because the chasm is so wide, and partly, actually, ironically, because so many people are self-made. They are meritocrats. They did it themselves. I think you're seeing a very different attitude from what you might have heard in the country clubs of America in the 1950s. And I'd like to just read you one um, set of quotes which I thought was very telling of this. Um, I tried very hard when I talked to people, because I talked to a lot of people in this sort of super, super elite, um, to talk to a representative group, to talk to people around the world, to talk to people in different sectors, and to talk to people from across the political spectrum. Um, and, and in particular, I tried to talk to a lot of Democrats as well as Republicans in the US. Having said that, um, this person who I'm going to cite um, is, he would call himself, you know, extremely conservative. Um, he's Foster Fries, uh, the Wyoming mutual fund investor who became medium prominent because he was the guy who funded Rick Santorum's super PAC. And he was really worried also about the budget deficit. And so I talked to him about, well, maybe he should pay more taxes to help with that. And this was his response. People don't realize how wealthy people self-tax. You know, there's a fellow who was the CEO of Target. In Phoenix, he's created a museum of music. He put in around 200 million of his own money. I have another friend who gave 400 million to a health facility in Nebraska or South Dakota or someplace like that. You look at Bill Gates, just gave 750 million, I think, to fight AIDS. I think we should get rid of taxes as much as we can because you get to decide how you spend your money rather than the government. I mean, if you have a certain cause, an art museum or a symphony, and you want to support it, it would be nice if you had the choice to support it. Where we're headed, you'll be taxed, your money will be taken away, and the government will support it. Then it got really interesting when we started talking about, kind of in some ways, the best plutocrats, the people who really clearly unambiguously made a great contribution and, and sort of what their relationship should be, not just to philanthropy, but actually you know, their legal obligation to the rest of society. If you look at what Steve Jobs has done for us, what Bill Gates has done for society, the government ought to pay them. Why do they collect money from Gates and Jobs for what they've contributed? It's ridiculous. It's that top 1% that probably contributes more to making the world a better place than the 99%. I've never seen any poor people do what Bill Gates has done. I've never seen poor people hire many people. So I think we ought to honor and uplift the 1%, the ones who have created value. Um, and this, this is all on video, by the way. Um, so, and, 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 and you can see how that all fits, right? If, if you are self-made, if you are one of the superstars in this superstar global economy, one of the winners in the winner-take-all economy, yeah, I, I am creating the value and poor people aren't. And, and I think that that is a very deep social and increasingly political chasm. As the final point I wanted to make, and then I'm going to stop talking and answer questions if people have any, is all of this is happening as one side of an economic coin. So, so one side of the economic coin of, you know, the big sort of glacial tectonic forces of the past 30 years is the rise at the very, very top, that, that sort of winner-take-all process. But... At the same time, those same forces that are driving the rise of the 1%, the 0.1%, and I do want to emphasize those same largely positive in and of themselves forces, or at least many of them positive, are hollowing out the middle class. The same technologies which are making it possible to be David Karp are devouring a lot of jobs in the middle. And increasingly, you know, we're, we're familiar with this happening in manufacturing. That's an old story. But increasingly, we're seeing this move up the economic chain. It's happening to white-collar jobs. There's a real crisis in the legal profession, partly driven by the fact that, partly driven by outsourcing, but partly driven by e-discovery. You know, we've discovered computers can do what we used to pay article students to do. When was the last time you used a travel agent? Uh, and, and for this reason, you know, 
the, the companies that can really prosper in this age of globalization, the technology revolution, do it partly because they don't need very many people. GM, at its apex, employed hundreds of thousands of people. Facebook, which I think is sort of the GM of our time, or AGM of our time, employs fewer than 10,000. Uh, this is true of globalization as well. It's raising hundreds of millions into the middle class in the poorest countries, but it's hollowing out jobs and exerting downward pressure on wages in the industrialized Western economy. And again, I talked to Larry Summers about this, and he says, look, one way to think about it is in 30 years it will be fine once the wages in the US and China are at the same level. 30 years is a long time to wait. Uh, to me, the real frightening reality is, you know, it turns out that there is no economic law which automatically translates change, which is actually economically beneficial, into widely shared gains. My concern isn't actually structural unemployment. Uh, I think that if you have a flexible and free labor market, new jobs will be created. You know, if people don't price themselves out of the market, we'll find something for people to do. But we need to think about what kind of, what kind of jobs those will be and what kind of a society it will be. Again, quoting Larry, his line on this is, we might be living in a future where the question we ask our children is, do they specialize in cleaning the shallow end or the deep end? Um, and my version of that sort of a dystopia is a world in which there are a few geniuses who invent Google and everybody else is employed giving them massages. Um, so that's, I think, you know, a pretty scary scenario, especially given that, you know, so much of what we think of as how Western industrialized economies work is based on a broad-based middle class. Um, and you see that even in the fact that most of us identify ourselves as middle class, really almost regardless of our income. So when I get really depressed about this, I sometimes try to take comfort from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and, you know, after all, for all its dark satanic mills, it worked out pretty well. All of us are healthier, live longer, are richer, taller. There are maybe a few exceptions to that one. Um, freer than our 19th century ancestors. But here's the rub. It took two depressions, the Great Depression and the Long Depression, two world wars, communist revolutions in Russia and in China, and an era of incredible social and political unrest and ferment before North America and Western Europe figured out how to make the economic realities of the Industrial Revolution work for society more broadly. And that figuring out was, you know, it wasn't a five-point policy platform that somebody came up with overnight. It was the invention, really, of what we think of as modern society. It was the invention of the income tax. It was the invention of public education. It was the invention of public health care. Well done, Americans, for finally catching up to the rest of us on that one. Uh, it was the invention of pension systems. Really, the invention of, you know, our modern social order. We are today in the midst of, I think really closer to the beginning than to the end, of a set of economic transformations which are comparable in their scale and their scope, and actually ultimately really their positive potential to the Industrial Revolution. What we do need to figure out, and what I think we've barely started to figure out, is what are the social and political adaptations. And they're, they're gonna have to be global social and political adaptations because these are now really global economic forces to make that economic change work for everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, yeah. So do I ask people to leave now? Can someone turn on the mic? I've droned on for so long, I really apologize for that.
Um, I didn't mean to. That's very rude of me. Um, uh, that I think we have to all leave the hall. Um, but if you want to talk to me, you can, of course. Um, and you could even buy my book and I would sign it for you with pleasure. But you don't have to do that. <laughs>